Hi, and thank you for joining me. This is now part 18 of our series, Rooted and Grounded in the Love of Christ. This is going to be the final one in the series. And what I intend to do in this video is to recap on all the elements that we have spoken about that I believe are important in our relationship with the Lord Jesus so that we might be truly rooted and grounded in him and in his wonderful love. So may the Lord open our understanding in our hearts as we wait upon him. And uh, I'd ask you to read along the scriptures and ponder them very carefully. Let's not allow familiarity to uh, rob us of the deep and glorious life-giving truths that are found in these wonderful scriptures. Let us start by going to the book of Hebrews. And it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. So the book of Hebrews is drawing our attention to the fact that God has spoken. In the past, it was by the prophets in various ways and at various times, but now he is speaking to us by his son. So God is communicating, and the very vital truth that we find in the book of Hebrews is the question is being asked, are we hearing? Have we heard what God is saying? That's the important issue. So the writer of Hebrews continues in chapter 2, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. He's basing this on the fact that now in these days, God is speaking to us by his son. Jesus is the message. He is the living word of God, and God is presenting his son to us. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, we must give the more careful attention to what is being said. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, that's in the Old Testament time, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, this salvation which embodies the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and his shed blood? So we will not escape if we neglect this very powerful and glorious message that God has given to us. These are vital uh, issues. The salvation, which was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So we have the writings of the apostles, those that heard him, and these are the things that we must give the more earnest heed to, because this is the very gospel that God has presented to us. And this is repeated a number of times in the book of Hebrews, as has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So that was said to the children of Israel who rebelled in the wilderness. The writer of Hebrews is using that same statement to say to us, let's not harden our hearts because we are hearing the most vital message. Let's pay greater attention to what is being said. Then he goes on in chapter five and he says about this, talking about the high priestly ministry of Jesus, we have much to say and it is hard to explain, this is the reason, since you have become dull of hearing. So he is identifying the fact that even though we might have heard a lot of ministry, a lot of explanation, a lot of teaching, it's possible that we have not fully comprehend nor applied ourselves to these things. And so we become dull of hearing. So this is what he's saying. Because of this, he needs to explain to us again what these um, very important elementary things are so that we can hear what God is saying and give very careful attention to this. He goes on to say, for though by this time, because of all the teaching you've heard and the experience that you might have had, you ought to be teachers. 
you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. So he's saying the basic principles of the oracles of God, God's word, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the combined message, the oracles of God. He says the first principles or the basic principles of these oracles is in fact the milk of the word. And he says, this is what we need to help our hearing and our comprehension and our application of these things. But he's identifying the fact that although we might have been Christians for a long time, it's possible that we have not actually grown to maturity, even though we might have heard a lot of ministry. He says, for everyone who lives on milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness since he is a child. So if we don't go on into maturity and if we don't apply these initial principles of the oracles of God, we will not correctly understand the word of God. So we need to grow to fully appreciate the word of God. We're unskillful while we are still those who need milk. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So let's look at what Paul has to say because he's got a similar thing uh, to speak about. And he says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly or carnal, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk and not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. And then he gives the reason why he says that. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere human beings, acting as those that are not even saved? So these are people that are saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. But he says there's jealousy and quarreling amongst them. Now, he is saying that, what they need is the milk of the word because they're not mature enough to hear the deeper issues of the word of God. Then Peter has a similar thing to say, and he says, therefore rid yourselves of malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Now again, Peter is talking to Christians, believers, and he's saying amongst them, there is malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. And he says, this should not be. We must rid ourselves of these things. And then he offers as the, the way out, the way to do this is, he says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So having tasted the goodness of the Lord, we now need to continue to feast upon the word of God, but particularly the milk of the word, which the writer of Hebrews has told us about, so that we may grow to maturity. So Paul goes on and tells us, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. So he's talking about the foundation. Then he says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid by God, which is Jesus Christ. So this is the only foundation upon which we should be built. So going back now to what the writer of Hebrews was saying, he says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. So these elementary principles of the oracles of God, which he says is the milk of the word, which we need in order to mature. He says we need to receive these things, but then go on to maturity. Let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of. So he is talking about the milk of the word, the first principles of the oracles of God as the foundation. And that's what Paul was saying. He had laid a foundation by feeding the Corinthian believers with milk. That is the foundation. And the foundation is Jesus Christ. But what the writer of Hebrews then does is he breaks it up into the elements that we've actually spoken about in this whole series from the beginning right through to now. And so 
Here is what the writer of Hebrews does. He summarizes these elements for us by presenting them to us in this way. He says it's the principle of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection, and eternal judgment. So these are the elements that we've actually spoken about, but now he is summarizing this for us and presenting it to us in this concise way that we may grasp what the milk of the word comprises and what the foundation is and how to be founded or as Paul puts it, rooted and grounded in Christ. We need to apply each one of these principles to our lives. So let's take a very brief and concise look at these principles. The first one is the principle of repentance from dead works. Here is a definition. Any activity I do to create an identity for myself or any activity I do to give myself a purpose. Now, these activities are not necessarily sin that we need to repent of, but they are futile. In other words, they're dead works. And the reason is God has already given us an identity. He's also given us a purpose. So God has given us an identity, and this is the identity, to bear his image and be his representative on earth. This is what Adam and Eve lost the moment they sinned. Because God made them in his own image and likeness and intended every human being to be a representative of himself on earth. He also gave Adam and Eve a purpose to rule over the creation. So I've said it this way. God has given us a purpose to promote the kingdom of God in partnership with himself by our words and by our behavior. So Adam and Eve lost this and mankind has been from that time until now seeking ways to earn a, an identi identity and a reputation. So we do things to gain an identity or a reputation and we are seeking a purpose. What am I here for? What is my purpose in this life? To find fulfillment in a purpose. And whatever we might do, it might not necessarily be sin, but it could be futile or a dead work. And this is what we need to do is do a, a very deep and clear examination of ourselves before the Lord to make sure that our identity and our purpose is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. So let's consider an example of this. Let's think of someone who might have a wonderful musical ability and they're able to sing. So they hone their skills, they practice, and they become very proficient at their singing. And then they gain a reputation as a singer and might, be, might even gain fame and fortune as a popular singer and uh, become very popular throughout the world. And this then is their identity. But it is short-lived because the time will come when they're too old to sing and the very reason for their reputation and identity is gone um, and it has no eternal value. So while in itself it is not a sin, it is just a futile or dead work because their true identity is to represent Jesus Christ. And every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. So our singing ability, every ability that we might have actually does come from the Lord. But we need to apply ourselves uh, to the things of God and recognize that in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to us. So what we could say is that it doesn't matter what our job is or our profession might be. Our first and foremost, our primary identity is the representative of Jesus Christ. So whatever our function is, whatever our um, occupation might be, we are first and foremost representatives of Jesus. And our whole purpose is that in whatever we do, we do heartily as unto the Lord. So that 
we are promoting the kingdom of God and we're exhibiting the fruit of the spirit wherever we are and we, whatever we might be doing, we're exhibiting these wonderful values of the kingdom of God. And we're promoting God's kingdom and we're doing it in partnership with him. And now the principle of faith toward God. Let's look at a definition. Believing that God is trustworthy and placing my personal confidence in him in every circumstance. So faith is not a lever to get things out of God or to get answers to my prayer, but rather recognizing the trustworthy character of God exhibited throughout scripture. All the oracles of God present God and his trustworthiness. And so my faith and my confidence is in the character of God who is absolutely trustworthy. Also knowing that God placed a value on my life by sacrificing Jesus in order to accept me and having confidence in God's invested love for me. In other words, believing with all my heart that as God has stated in his word, Jesus died on my behalf and he has accepted me personally. I'm accepted in the beloved, in Christ, and God loves me and I am confident in that love. This is being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. So this principle of faith towards God is absolute confidence in what God has declared and what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ, on my behalf. The principle of the doctrine of baptisms. Here is the definition. Baptism means immersion. So it's immersion into Jesus and all that he is and all that he stands for. So I've been immersed into Jesus Christ. That is, so here's a further explanation. It's immersion into his death and burial. Now, how do we do that? It's by water baptism. So the water symbolizes my death and my burial. But the action of baptism is I'm actually identifying myself as being dead with Jesus, buried with him. And then as I come up out of the waters, embracing a new life in Jesus, now that we are part of his earthly representative body, become part of the people who are the followers of Jesus and part of of his heavenly kingdom. We're also immersed by the Lord Jesus into the Holy Spirit to empower us to be his earthly representatives. So having found my identity in Christ, having been immersed into him, he then empowers me with his spirit so that I, I am in, enabled to shine for him and have power to be his representative on earth. This, of course, will attract opposition. So enduring the opposition that this will attract and learning obedience through these difficult experiences. Now, James says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations and trials, knowing that these trials are working for us endurance. But he says, let endurance have its perfect work so that you might be entire and lacking in nothing. So all of this works together. All things work together for good to those who are called according to the purpose of God. Okay, the principle of the laying on of hands, one that is not always easily understood, but it simply means this, imparting to others what we have received. Right through the Old Testament, you'll find that where there was the laying on of hands, what they were doing was, they had received a blessing, they were imparting the blessing. So that's the principle in the New Testament, a similar thing, imparting the blessing. It may not even mean uh, physically laying hands on someone, but having received something from the Lord, we now impart that. We're, we're giving what we have received. So that is to make a difference in this world as an ambassador or representative of Jesus advancing the values of God's kingdom wherever we are, with the view to seeing others believe in Jesus, come to salvation, and encouraging them to become dedicated followers of him, disciples of the Lord Jesus. 
so we're inspiring and encouraging others to follow the Lord Jesus. That's the principle of laying on of hands, giving everything that we have received to enrich others uh, with the blessing that we have received. The principle of resurrection. Recognizing that we have become part of the new creation. So when Jesus rose and walked out of that tomb, he was the very first human being to rise from the dead. That was the beginning of the new creation. As Paul puts it, this is the order of creation. Jesus, the first fruits of those that died, and then afterwards, those that are his at his coming. So we, we recognize now that because we've identified ourselves with the death, the burial of Jesus, we also identify ourselves with the resurrection of Jesus and we've become new creatures in Christ or part of the new creation. That is living now by eating of the tree of life, which means loving, meditating upon and living and obeying God's word, enabled by God's grace and empowered by his spirit, feasting upon the Lord Jesus, abiding in the vine. Um, so we're living this new life being part of the new creation by eating of Jesus or by receiving the word of God, applying it and walking in it. But also living in certain hope of receiving a new physical body at the second coming of Jesus. So when he appears, we shall be like him. Uh, this body can inhabit both God's realm and also the new earthly realm in the new creation. So we see this example in the resurrection body of Jesus, how that he could appear and disappear. He could come right through the, the walls, the closed doors where the disciples were, and he could appear before him, before them rather, eat supper with them and then disappear. So this new body that God is going to give to us will be similar. We'll be able to enter into the heavenly realm where God and all the angels are, but also find ourselves in the earthly realm. So it's a wonderful thing to look forward to, this glorious body the scripture speaks about. And finally then, the principle of eternal judgment. This principle, the definition is, recognition that I'm answerable to God for all my actions, attitudes, thoughts, and words. Everything that I am, I'm answerable to God. He is um, watching and he is recording everything that I do and say. But what is really wonderful is that he also has given us access to his mercy and forgiveness. So if we repent of our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as he also says, our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. He'll cast them as far as the east is from the west. So our sin will be have been dealt with and blotted out. But everything that we have done will uh, be recorded and will be rewarded if it is done, if it is, as, as Paul puts it, if it is like gold, silver and precious stones. The things that we have done that are futile, dead works, those things will be burnt up. And uh, we will suffer loss, as Paul says, but we will be rewarded for those things that we do to the glory of God. So being a follower of Jesus is not a passive state, but an active lifestyle that has eternal consequences and benefits in the kingdom of God and the new creation. So this is in the back of our mind, as Paul said, the things that we do now have a far greater an eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things that are seen because the things that are seen are temporal but we look beyond that to the things that are unseen which are eternal so we realize that all the things that we're doing the life that we live now has eternal consequences and we keep that in mind because we're accountable to the lord let's consider now on the authority of the Lord Jesus, what he has to say about this very same subject. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them 
will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So he is also emphasizing the need to hear him and to do what he has said. And then he speaks about the rock. Now we know that Jesus told Peter that he was the rock. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus is the rock. We know when Peter writes about this in his letter, he says that he is the chief cornerstone which the builders rejected. In other words, Jesus is that foundation stone, that rock. So here is the Lord Jesus speaking about this. Build our lives upon him. He says, because the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And then the opposite. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. In other words, we can hear so much ministry, but then become dull of hearing. That's what Jesus is also saying. He says he, he will liken that person to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Unfortunately, in our desperate search for identity, to gain a reputation, to find a purpose, we may live our whole lives and eventually find that we've actually been building on the sand. And when we come to the end of our lives, we have nothing eternal to show for it. So this is the challenge that the Word of God is, is giving us. And this is, in fact, what the Lord Jesus is speaking about. And obviously he is referring to the Sermon on the Mount when he says, hear these words of mine. Now, what we call the Sermon on the Mount are, are the words of Jesus where he breaks down in practical terms the very principle of the law of God. Jesus tells us that the, the underlying foundation and principle of the law of God is this that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is setting out in practical terms exactly how we should do that. And this is the same thing that we're being told by the writer of Hebrews, that by using the principles or the milk of the word, our senses will be exercised by constant use so that we will be able to discern what is good and evil and be directed by the Lord to not only love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul and be rooted and grounded in Jesus, but also be able to give to others what we have received. So we will become a blessing to those around about us. So finally then, let us conclude with this wonderful prayer that Paul prays. And may we pray this prayer for one another. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's where we get our identity and our purpose. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God going on to maturity, receiving the milk of the word, responding to it, applying it in our lives so that we may be mature and rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. Amen.